everyone. I'm very excited today to be talking uh, about uh, climate, but uh, with a very different perspective, uh, thinking about what companies, what are the solutions. We often talk about the problem of, uh, of uh, climate change, about the environmental issues, but uh, uh, what are the solutions, what uh, we can do uh, to, to, to change the system, to, to make a, a real transition. And for that, today, I'm very happy to be with uh, Julian Karspor, He's uh, working for uh, Climate Justice with the project uh, Drawdown. I don't know if you have heard about that, but I really recommend to go check the website. It's uh, an amazing platform full of uh, different uh, solutions for uh, climate change. And he's also uh, very active when it comes to activism. He has been organizing different um, um, platforms and groups that uh, they are advocating for, for um, climate change and for the preservation of the environment and he's a very accomplished climber so I think he's the best uh, example as uh, someone that uh, loves the outdoor sports that loves sports and he he practices a lot and he's working for uh, what we love that is the outdoors is the mountains so uh, yeah thanks uh, Julian to be here with us today yeah thanks so much for having me it's, a, it's an honor to talk to you today yeah, and I, I was saying that we often like focus on the problems like we we hear in the news, like it's uh, now in Europe, it's a crazy, warm, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's insanely warm, like uh, in the south of Europe, it's like 40, 50 Celsius degrees, which is like insane. We have been here in Pakistan, in India, it's like record-breaking temperatures, uh, and with uh, the the crisis, uh, with the, the the fossil fuels, um, we we are really hearing a lot of the the, the problems uh, that uh, climate change is causing in the in the news. But we are not um, talking much about the solutions, and that's uh, what you are like kind of doing in your uh, in your work. Yeah, exactly. No, I think the the kind of mind shift to to focus on solutions is is so important. Um, it's kind of remarkable that the the IPCC, which is like the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, you know, group of international uh, governments and and researchers from around the world, they've been studying the problem of climate change for the last thirty years, and and maybe folks are familiar with the IPCC, um, and in, not until this past year, till this twenty twenty two, did they publish a list of solutions. Which is just kind of wild, and and it, it shows you know the the silent science is well established that we have a, a big problem, and and it, it's got all these cascading you know uh, effects uh, in terms of human health and uh, and uh, yeah effects you know so many people around the world, and it's time to just kind of start thinking about solutions. And so yeah, it's great that they finally published that that solutions uh, list, but uh, it's it's kind of uh, yeah, it's time that we all shift in that direction because um, there's there's really are a lot of solutions. And um, according to the math that Project Drawdown has done, uh, you know, if we implement those solutions, we actually can bend the curve on on CO two and other greenhouse gases, and actually uh, you know stop global warming or or climate change. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's good that to have you here and talk about the solutions. But before we start, like going more on depth on that, uh, I, I have a climbing wall just behind of me. But I'm a very bad climber, so uh, you, you are a, a very active climber. And um, how did it come to you, like the, the activism and this protection to to the environment? It started like uh, you were a climber and you saw like the problems when you were, were going to the outdoors and, and then you started doing activism or it was the other way around. And what, what's your relation with the, the, the climbing community and, uh, and, the, uh, and the environment, the, the environment yeah. protection? Yeah, I think um, I can go back and tell a little bit of my story. So, uh, yeah, I, I grew up in uh, Berkeley, California, uh, in the Bay Area. Um, and I kind of always think I had an environmental ethic. My, my mom has been involved in kind of transformative, uh, sustainable food systems and local food systems work. And so I kind of like grew up in like a milieu of folks and also Berkeley, California is just a very, uh, it's surrounded by folks who, who are kind of uh, cut from that sort of environmental activist cloth. Um, 
but yeah, and then uh, and then in terms of the the climbing, so so I mean, I guess those those two things kind of intertwined. But um, I I grew up actually mostly as a soccer player uh, and was was loved soccer. And then about I think thirteen or fourteen, I went to San Francisco and um, and uh, went to the Victoria Theater in San Francisco and saw Chris Sharma's King Lines. Um, <laughs> and, and uh, it was nice a great movie. movie. Um, and, yeah, I was a you know fourteen year old boy, thirteen, fourteen, and uh, you know I think I got a prana chalk bag and shook Chris's hand, and uh, and uh, you know just was so inspired by someone just traveling the world and adventuring. It just looks so fun. Um, and you know my background, I, I had been going up and adventuring with my family in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Uh, and so I was already pretty outdoorsy. Um, but then this was just, it just felt like it fit so well. So I literally left the the movie theater and, and started like climbing the fire escape. <laughs> I was like so psyched uh, about climbing from that, from that day. And like next day I bought climbing shoes and I feel like, you know, now it's almost 15 years later and, um, I, I've been like climbing very, very consistently ever since that day, um, which is pretty, pretty wild. But, um, and, you know, I, I ended up starting doing a lot of climbing in, in like the Sierra Nevada, mostly starting off like a lot of people bouldering, um, because that's kind of what's, what's accessible, especially when you get started in a, in a gym. And then, uh, and then I went to, actually, I, I moved to Spain for a little bit, um, to the Pais Vasco. Um, and, uh, that's where I bought my first harness. And, uh, I was actually taught to kind of, uh, um, I don't know if you, you may know him, but, uh, to like rope climb by like a famous, uh, Basque alpinist named Juanjo San Sebastian. Um, yeah, yeah, of course. Like, yeah, it's it, it looks like with Chris Sharma and, and you, you have a good uh, Spanish yeah, influence. I, I can't uh, say yeah. I actually know Chris Sharma. I just you know a, a bunch of fanboys that were uh, <laughs> shaking his hand. But um, but yeah, Juanjo was a it was like a, a friend of a family friend that we had in in the Basque country, and and he knew I was a climber, and so he was so generous, and and he took me out, uh, and like we went, we bought you know in Casco Viejo and in, in uh, Bilbao, like bought my first harness and stuff like that. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we did a bunch of really cool climbing in the kind of, uh, that Northern part of, uh, you know, the Basque region in Spain. Um, and I also have some great memories of, of like climbing in the, the tunnels of Chordinaga. I'm not sure if you've ever been there, but like all the tunnels yeah. train. Yeah. And, and, and it's good. Like if you started like climbing with, uh, Juanjo and all these guys, they, they are very hardcore and they are very yeah. authentic. It's not like the fancy, like, uh, yeah, it's not the ones that they make balls like every one meter, but they are pretty Definitely. hard, like a hardcore school. So yeah, it's it's a very very yeah. good base you get there. Yeah, and then I went on to go to college after that my kind of Spain experience, and and then I got really into kind of rope climbing and multi pitch climbing, and and I, I consider myself kind of interested in all types of of climbing. Um, uh, so like climbing, you know, on El Cap in Yosemite and also like love bouldering and love sport climbing. And so like that kind of run the, run the whole gamut. Um, also love Indian Creek, you know, crack climbing too. Um, but yeah. And then I would say the, you know, just to kind of tie it back to the environmental activism side of things. Um, I think the first moment where I, I really got super, I've kind of, like I said, been kind of interested in these issues since high school, since, you know, pre for a pretty long time. Um, but the first kind of moment where I really started getting involved in activism was, uh, with some college students around the coal fired power plant, which is called Drake coal fire power plant, power plant in Colorado Springs. Um, uh, which is, so I went to college at Colorado college and, and then, uh, yeah, we did like a fair amount of protesting for this to, to essentially shut down this, this coal fired power plant in Colorado Springs, which mm -hmm. <clears throat> I learned last year actually got shut down, which is, which is great. Um, so one last coal fired right. power plant, uh, causing climate change. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, and then, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, so pretty much right after college, I've just been involved in nonprofits. So I worked for an organization called Friends of the Earth for many years. And then now I work for uh, an organization called Project Drawdown. Um, and so I've kind of like stayed in this lane. And, and uh, yeah, I feel like you know, my environmental ethic has transformed so much and, and uh, you know, really 
for me, it feels like uh, there's so many reasons to work on climate change. It's, it's not just because I want to protect nature. It's also because, uh, you know, climate really implicates the effects of climate change really implicates all the other issues that I care about, like social justice and equity um, and and like, you know, international and global justice. Um and and so in addition to, you know, protecting the places that I love to recreate in and climb in and the mountains that I love, um, it also feels like it touches all these other threads um, from like food systems to international justice or global justice work. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of uh, I would say like kind of where I, I got a lot of my motivation. But that's um, that, that's a good story. And, and, and it really was nice. And what, what you were saying that. Uh, Climate change, the, or like uh, the, the preservation of environment, is not only about like keeping nature beautiful, but I, I think one of the biggest problems we have communicating is that we are always talking about the nature and to to keep the the landscape. But at the end of the day, like we are talking about human existence. Like uh, it's not like the minerals, the mountains, the the deserts. They will, they don't care if it's like. 40, 50, 400 degrees. Uh, they don't care if it's like more or less biodiversity, but uh, we need it for, for surviving. And, and I think um, that's, uh, that's something that we should kind of remember uh, when we are thinking about preservation or like uh, fighting climate change. And I don't know how is the, the situation in, in US with the other community, but um, what I see here in Europe is that people is more aware about... Um, uh, about the environmental issues, about the climate change, it's uh, it's much more in social media or in, in conversations. But at the end of the day, uh, when it comes to to to, cho- to the choices that people is making of the daily life, or with uh, more uh, activism, uh, it's is not really translating. Uh, like outdoor people have a high. Um, awareness about climate change uh, and, and the problems, but uh, we are still mm, like a group of people that we have a, a pretty high carbon footprint as individuals. And, and, and it, it seems that uh, this correlation between what we, our conscience and, and our actions there is, is not the same. What's the situation in the, in the, in the U.S. about, uh, about that? Yeah, I'd say I'd say pretty similar to what it sounds like it, it is in in Europe. I think, uh, like you say, I think most of the activism, the activism, and maybe in quotes that I, that I see in the in the climbing community in the U.S. is is based in social media. Um, and I don't think it's all bad. You know, I think that uh, social media is powerful for you know raising awareness um, and you know educating people, spreading information. Um, I think there's also opportunities like for solidarity on social media and, and also, you know, there can be sometimes like effective, uh, like fundraising, fundraising efforts, which, which do have like a material impact on, on social media. Um, but I, I do think it's, it's just far too limited. Um, and, uh, I mean, I think I would love to see the, the climbing community become a little bit more sort of engaged in actual, like, you know, climate activism. Um, and I mean, I think in general, like it's something that we, we need more of, um, uh, you know, in 2020 before the pandemic, there was like this amazing rise in, uh, protests and, and mobilization around climate. Um, and you know, we, we were, we're getting to the point where we were seeing historic levels of turnout at protests in the United States and I think around the world. Um, and I think the, the pandemic really like, you know, put a damper on that because people couldn't organize and get together. And, and I think that, you know, it would be, great to see the the climbing community actually get involved in like you know organizing on the street and and going to protests and and really advocating for issues uh in in that way um and that doesn't always mean like you need to protest and do something illegal you know like there's plenty of roles to be had around that space once you get involved in sort of an activist community you can be behind a computer helping to organize folks and and you know mobilizing people um and and I think, um, you know, you don't have to like risk arrest or anything like that. There's plenty of different roles that folks can play. Um, but I guess I'll, I'll mention that one thing I think I do appreciate about the sort of 
activism and, and sort of social media activism in the United States. I think it's, I think the climate community in the U.S. and probably around the world to a certain extent is really starting to focus more on like DEIJ, diversity, equity, and, and inclusion work. Um, and, you know, like really, you know, obviously there's a, there's a long way to go in that path. But um, I think it's great because, you know, I think what we need is like an intersectional, multiracial sort of justice oriented climate movement um, instead of like a climate movement that is uh, um, sort of like solely focused on conservation or land preservation or or it's kind of like takes out that that human element. Um, and ideally, like sort of in my vision and what my I understand about kind of movements is that, you know, like it's going to be much stronger if we, we join with, you know, together and support like, you know, for instance, like Black Lives Matter in the United States, um, instead of being kind of siloed and, and fractionalized, uh, it's just, it's like, you know, you're just going to have much less power. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, like we're all kind of advocating for the same issues, which is like, you know, like justice, equal justice or, uh, for everyone and including like, you know, the environment and biodiversity and all these things, which are all deeply intertwined and connected with, with, uh, with human activity. Um, so yeah, I think like in general, it would be great to see a little bit more focused organizing in, uh, the U S kind of climate activism space. Um, yeah, my, my, like, activism experience has, has been outside of the climbing community. And there's a few, you know, folks that I'll, uh, organize with that happen to be climbers, which is fun, but there's, there's not a lot of like sort of climbing centric, uh, uh, activism that's going on right now, which, um, which I think is a huge missed opportunity. Um, like, as, as you say, there's a lot of climbers that are ready to, to act. Um, and yeah, so I think that's one of the reasons why I really appreciate you, you doing this podcast and, and doing the, you know, athlete climate Academy, because I think it's, it's filling a void that, that needs to be filled. Yeah. Thank you. We, yeah. We are trying to, to make the, the, the other people, the sport people to get more awareness and, and to also like, I think it's important to, to get to know what's, what, what's the science telling, what are the, the resources that we can find to, to talk with a property or to, to, to have a background so we can explain things and we can, we can really go deep into the subjects and, and, um, uh, we are trying to spread that into the, the other community and, and try to see if, uh, yeah, if people can engage slowly, but, uh, more and more. And I'm talking about, uh, resources and about, uh, um, what we can, what we can say, what we can find, uh, in the, in the drum down project, like it's, it's amazing. Like, I, I really recommend everyone to go there to the website and to, to have a look because you have been putting together, like, I don't know, hundreds, thousands of different, very concrete solutions that uh, companies uh, or even like uh, public governments can take for uh, for every particular problem. So it's not talking about we need to get like uh, carbon neutral, but it's how we can do that, for example, like in a very, uh, very concrete uh, measure. And um, now, can you explain me a bit like uh, what's the random project, what's, what's behind them, and who is like... Uh, it's for companies, it's for private industries, or it's for individuals. Who is um, the, the the user who can profit from that? <clears throat> yeah, um, yeah. So I could I could give a little overview and background of of Project Drawdown. Um, so and yeah, like you said, thank you, thanks for the endorsement. I, I definitely encourage people to go check out more information on uh, Drawdown dot org. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, you know resources and information online. Um, but yeah, so Project Drawdown was founded in in twenty seventeen, um, and it was kind of founded uh, as sort of the synthesis of this uh, research project, like about three year research project, which was asking the question, the kind of very simple question, like what are the most effective solutions to, to climate change? Um, and it's kind of remarkable that nobody had really asked the question in that that same way. Um, and, and like we said at the top of the hour, you know, this is really focusing us to really think about solutions. You know, we, we have enough information on the problem, but like now we need to really focus on solutions. Um, so uh, so back in 2017, the, the research that was published and it got published in a book called Drawdown, um, 
laid out at the time, it was the, the 100 most effective solutions to climate change. Um, uh, and then it was organized in this really nice solutions uh, kind of framework so that people could kind of understand where solutions sit in various sectors. And so Project Drawdown has done this research um, to kind of uh, identify solutions in the electricity sector, the food, agriculture, and land use sector, the industrial sector, the transportation sector, the building sector, like um, the sort of land and coastal sinks area, the engineered sinks area, um, and then also importantly, the kind of health and education, um, because health and education, you know, it, it, you know, it's, it, there's, there's a reason to do that by itself because it's really important um, that everybody gets access to health and education, but it also happens to be uh, a really powerful, uh, you know, climate solution, especially educating women and girls. Um, and, and so, <clears throat> yeah, so that's kind of, what I describe as drawdown 1.0 um, is is kind of doing this analysis and really providing the world with like you know this list of solutions. Um, and what we calculated is that you know if all those solutions get scaled up in a in a way that's totally economically f feasible and viable, then we actually do for, like from a mathematic perspective, we do have like the possibility of bending the curve and reaching the point of drawdown where where greenhouse gases in the atmosphere peak and then begin to decline um, and like essentially solve the, the, the problem of climate change. Um, uh, and, and so it brings like this very hopeful message. Um, and I think another thing that that research em emphasized is that, you know, uh, now is better than new. So time is of the essence. Uh, and we actually, we actually have all the tools, like we have all the solutions according to our research and the research that the IPCC just uh, produced to start to bend the curve and start to implement these solutions. Um, so we really need to be focusing on implementing those existing solutions, um, you know, pr probably rather than and uh, kind of investing in sort of net zero solutions or in, in kind of a far off, uh, you know, direct air capture or, you know, bioenergy and carbon capture, uh, which although they probably will be important, you know, down the line um, right now, the most important thing to do is to, to you know, um, you know, it, it implement the solutions that actually we know will work and we know will reduce carbon. Um, essentially, it's just easier to reduce carbon before it's emitted in the atmosphere, but uh, then much easier than trying to extract it out of the atmosphere. Um, so we should focus on that. Um, and so that, yeah, that all was kind of a long description of Drawdown 1.0. And then Drawdown 2.0 is saying kind of like, okay, how can we as an organization really start to implement these solutions and scale these solutions in the world? Um, and so that's where the, the program that I work for is Drawdown Labs. And so we're um, essentially... Uh, so we focus on the private sector. So we, we call ourselves a laboratory. And so we're like a testing ground for the private sector to kind of accelerate the scaling of climate solutions. And we work with businesses. Um, and then increasingly, we're also working with uh, investors and philanthropies on like how they can really <clears throat> elevate their leadership and climate action to really kind of drive this kind of moment of, of, of drawdown. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, is uh, you know, the way that we work uh, as as Drawdown Labs and most of the work that I do is focused on the kind of business side of things, less so on the investor and philanthropy, um, is to, we kind of, our, our, our like theory of change is twofold. So one thing that we're really focused on is democratizing who's working on climate change uh, so that every, like within a business, so that every employee in the business can make their job a climate job. Um, if that makes sense. So instead of like having the, you know, in, in a lot of companies, you have like the sustainability office, maybe, you know, if you're lucky, you have a big sustainability office that's well resourced mm -hmm. or like the C-suite, you know, the, the CEO and CFO and all these things, you know, to, uh, making the big decisions about what they're going to do on climate. Um, but we think that in order to make the kind of transformative change that we need, we need employees to be engaged and activated, both to make their job function more aligned with sort of the company's climate goals or their own climate goals, but then also to push the company in the right directions to try to tr move the company to, to make sure that, you know, it's really aligned with uh, a climate safe future. Um, and, you know, like everybody's got a stake in that, you know, um, and and so then the yeah. second part of that is is to really and it's connected a little bit because we think employees are key to pushing the level, but is we're focused on 
really elevating what the the status quo is for for what uh, business climate leadership looks like. So right now, I think over the past 20 years, we've heard a lot of talk about, you know, uh, stakeholder capitalism and, uh, you know, all this greenwashing and, and, and companies saying that they're doing all these great things in terms of, you know, uh, the environment and climate. Um, and we just don't have a lot to show for it, you know, um, and not to say like a lot of great work has happened in that space, but uh, it's it's been far too limited. Um, and in our opinion, it's been far too limited to kind of operational emissions reductions um, uh, instead of kind of systemic levers for, for change, which obviously climate change is a systemic problem. And so we need systemic solutions and, and companies need to really figure out, you know, how they can get involved in pulling kind of these systemic levers uh, for change. Um, so that's kind of like a long-winded description of <laughs> what we're working on. But it's it's very interesting, and and, and I think uh, a lot of the of the athletes that they are listening, they can like think about what the companies that they are uh, working with, or like that they are sponsor, or or, or if people is like um, buying from a company or other what they are doing. And uh, it, it's true that most of the companies they have are responsible for like environment but that's very disconnected somehow with the people that is working on design or that is working with the business plans or what is working with commercial and at the end of the day it's like two different agendas um, and often it's the, the, the commercial one uh, that that wins and um, and that's uh, it's very interesting as you say like to to have the these environmental like uh, um yeah, know how and, and positioning all the different employees of a company because then it's like uh, starting from zero to 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 the top. Like everyone is 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 thinking on like what they can do and what are the goals. And um, you also mentioned like the um, greenwashing and like uh, it's it's. Um, I, I think that companies are doing good things. Like uh, it's uh, when it comes to innovation, to materials, it's it's a lot of things going on. But uh, when you see the the footprint, the global footprint of the industry, it's, it's just increasing. So it's not um, it's not enough. I would say it's uh, to just make products that they are better. Uh, it seems that uh, it's somehow good, but it's not enough. And and, and that uh, you know, so like we need some more systemic changes. Uh, and uh, that's. Uh, the reasoning between like, okay, if we are just like selling more eco products, but uh, keeping the same system, like we are also extracting resources. Uh, um, we are also like um, promoting like other, other mm -hmm. consumerism. And w what would you say like are the, the, the very basic things a company should look or, or if uh, you are an athlete and you are saying to, to, to your company what what should the company yeah. focus on what yeah. would you say like it's uh biomaterials or is like a uh, recyclable um um materials or is more like uh, as you mentioned going to empowering the employees or like to to look into the mm -hmm. the business models or or what where do you see that it's uh more possible uh change yeah. right now <clears throat> um yeah, so I would say, like, interestingly enough, um, you know, I think, like you said, first off, there is a lot of great work that's happening on circularity and, and you know, bio-based materials and a lot of amazing innovation that's happening and, and definitely is important and, like, should be recognized. Um, but I would, I would kind of, like, interestingly argue that the most important thing that uh, a lot of companies can do, and I think it really depends on, on the company, uh, is to... Um, not actually focus on operational emissions reductions. I mean, I think they should be focusing on op operational emissions reduction, but I think it's possible that the most important thing that they do doesn't necessarily fall into that emissions reductions category. Um, so I think that, um, you know, all the work that they, that they do to try to reduce, you know, for a lot of outdoor companies in particular, apparel companies, the, the scope three emissions are going to be the, yeah, the supply chain emissions, both upstream and downstream. Um, you know, those, those for most apparel and outdoor companies make up, uh, 80 to probably 95% of their carbon emissions. Um, and so I think it's really important to 
to work with suppliers and kind of think about like the whole like chain of supply and, and reducing emissions in, in, in those areas. <clears throat> um, and, and some companies are really starting to, to, to look into that. Um, and I think the outdoor companies in particular are, are really like, you know, ahead of other industries in terms of uh, like concepts like circularity where where you have long lifetime warranties and uh and you know rights to repair and things like that um and so there's there's some great like work that's happening in that space but um but again i i would say there's some missed opp opportunities so like that work is amazing and it should continue and and and, and go on um but uh, in addition to that, companies need to figure out how they can affect kind of broader change. And I would say like two kind of main areas st uh, stand out for me. So one is how can the company uh, get involved in instigating sort of the political change that we need and the regulatory change that we need to shift in incentives kind of at the broader sort of country uh, you know, national and even international, because these things scale up or, you know, you could, you could start with the, you know, city, state, uh, and then national, international, um, like, you know, how, how can, how can they be supportive of the, the necessary climate policy that we need to, to, to really like invest in the transformative change that we, that we want. Um, and that's not only like the company, the company has the opportunity to, you know, be active and support like climate policy um, and support like, you know, climate positive politicians. Um, but then typically companies and outdoor companies are good examples of this are part of trade associations or, or, you know, trade groups. Um, and those trade groups, you know, have wield like a certain amount of influence in the political process. And you need to make sure as an organization that your trade group or your trade organization that's that's lobbying for certain policies um, in the United States in Washington, uh, you know, is aligned with your climate goals. There's a lot of potential to, uh, I think, like uh, realign with your trade associations um, uh, and make sure that they're aligned with kind of your climate priorities. Um, and then the second thing that I would argue is kind of actually part of it's now being included. It's sort of like the, the newest part of scope three emissions, which is your financial supply chain. So I would say that, uh, you know, making sure that companies are also understanding their financed emissions um, and then working to reduce those financed emissions. Um, and so we think about that in kind of two ways. One is uh, if they have, you know, in, in the UK it's, or in the, in the, you know, Europe, it's typically, um, you know, pension funds. Um, but so, so working to, you know, uh, realign those pension funds and, and move them into kind of climate safe retirement funds. In the US, it's a lot of like defined contribution uh, 401k plans um, and and offering employees climate safe 401k options uh, is uh, like a really powerful thing that companies can do. So that's one part. Um, and then another part is thinking about the the kind of corporate cash that a company holds. So companies work with just like an individual, they work with banks uh, and financial institutions like asset managers uh, all around the world to, to hold their their investments and their money and their bonds. And, and, and it, you know, for different companies, that money will look different. But in all cases, there's an opportunity to, to push those financial institutions to uh, make sure that they're the money that is is really those co that company's money is not being invested, you know, behind their back in fossil fuel projects. Um, and in some cases, you know, like you know, a company that has like a you know a million dollar fund to protect you know natural resources and work on climate change, but then they've got ten million dollars, you know, uh, that's in being invested in fossil fuels, which is just like some percentage of the the money that they have it being like in the financial institution. Um, and it's not necessarily the company's fault that, that that's the case, but it, yeah, that's and that's also not in individuals because we see like a lot of people that it's uh, really like active or like trying to do very good. But then like uh, we've been seeing like uh, now it's uh, many banks that they are investing on on new extraction plants for petrol and and that's like um, that's uh, yeah, it's insane that. Uh, Today, like uh, I was uh, hearing, like in France, it's uh, five of the major banks that they are really 
uh, investing uh, eight uh, billions to 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 new uh, plants of petrol, like new extraction, and and you might be one client of this bank, and you don't know that uh, you can be protesting, you can do uh, like trying to be uh, very. Uh, environmental in your choices, but then you have maybe your money in these banks that they are really pushing uh, for fossil fuels. So like companies or individuals, I think it's one one of the biggest focus that we should uh, look on uh, w- 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 what our money is doing. And and, and uh, that's, uh, as you mentioned, that maybe it's uh, our footprint it's uh it's bigger there than with all the actions that we are doing in our daily life as a as a person or as a company absolutely yeah no i think that's right yeah um so yeah those are the kind of like kind of main things sorry for the background noise um but I, that i would say that yeah. companies could be kind of focusing on um we we i'll just quickly make a plug so drawdown labs the organization that i work for published a report in in uh um last year september of, of 2021 and uh, in that report, we kind of outlined uh, what's called the drawdown aligned business framework. Um, and so that essentially has eight uh, leverage points that we uh, put out, like kind of uh, establish, which uh, and, and the, the first one is emissions reduction, which is kind of what we were talking about earlier. But then we have seven other opportunities that companies can use to sort of like pull these kind of more systemic leverage points and, you know, investments in finance and, and, you know, climate policy advocacy are, are two of that broader framework. But if you're more interested in kind of learning about that, go check out the, the drawdown aligned business framework on, on, you know, product drawdowns website. Yeah, we we'll, we will put the link uh, on the on the notes. Uh, I think it will be very interesting for 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 all our users. And just one last question um, to finish. We are talking about uh, the industry and how to be sustainable, um, but we, we we are living in a planet that it's limited. Like uh, it has a, a, a surface, it has like a, a, a weight, it has like. A, an amount of resources that they are limited, like it's it's this amount of water, this amount of minerals, this amount of um, different species. And uh, when we talk about economy, like governments, they are always talking about the the growth of the of the country. And it's it's always good if it's growing. That's what uh, we always hear that uh, a country to be to be performing well, it needs to be growing all the time. And companies the same, like. Uh, uh, we see that the company is doing better if it's growing, but um, it seems that at the point uh, growing uh, exponentially in a planet that is limited, it's uh, it's not possible. It's something missing in the equation. And um, what's your your personal thought on on that on 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 the the growth and the the growth of the companies? What that implies, and especially I, I know that. Talking about the growth in a in economy, it seems that it's 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 the devil. It seems that it's something that uh, we shouldn't talk about, or that it's uh, going against uh, sustainable business. But uh, I personally believe that it's possible to do uh, yeah sustainable as a business to 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 earn money, to be able to 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 pay your workers, to be able to to invest, but uh, not not only extracting more that at the end it's uh, what happens with uh, infinite uh, um, growth yeah it's such an important question and and uh, I wish more people asked this question because uh, it's it it uh, it's still I think it's still taboo to sort of question growth in in a lot of especially in the kind of uh, you know corporate sustainability and corporate re- social responsibility spaces, um, but I think it's it's such a it's such a necessary question, um, and I think what you pointed out at the very top, which is like at what cost, you know. So I think if you like if you like look at the history of uh, you know economic growth. Uh, Typically, you know, it's growing and creating wealth for a subset of the population, whether that's a country or, uh, you know, elite class. Um, and it's leaving people out uh, and whether that's people or ecosystems that are being kind of essentially 
sort of uh, externalized or sacrificed uh, in order to create this profit. Um, and so I think understanding sort of the other side of the equation, like you just said, is is absolutely critical. Um, and I think in some cases, you know, uh, it, I think I think what 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 that does, what that sort of incorporating or balancing the equation does, it, is it makes us understand that maybe the the thing that we should be optimizing for is an economic growth. Because if you incorporate all those externalities, then you realize that you know, although growth has brought a lot of amazing things, you know, economic growth has brought a lot of amazing things in, in the world. Uh, it also has come at immense cost. And it's time that we kind of really start to look at the true cost of that, um, um, you know, at a global perspective, um, and at kind of like really that ecosystem and ecological perspective as well. Um, and obviously, we're in this point of sort of, uh, sort of late uh, climate crisis, you know, it's pretty clear that we're coming up against the sort of ecological limits of our planet, and it's having kind of devastating impacts across the, 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 the world. Um, so I think it's just so that it's so important that we kind of think about this, this question. Um, and I think that there's like a, a few different areas that are, uh, exciting to me in this space. So I think one area is, you know, you've, you're starting to get the introduction of, uh, you know, in this bit, in the business sphere, you're starting to get the introduction of, you know, businesses that are legally bound to, uh, uh, things besides just profit. So B Corp is an example, and a lot of outdoor companies are are part of B Corp, um, where like l they're legally bound to be working on like you know societal issues, workers' rights, community, the environment, in addition to their kind of profit motive. Um, and so I think these models are super important in kind of expanding the the scope of what a business and an economy is optimizing for. Um, and then I would also just point out that I think that the the work, I mean, I, I'm a big, like, I'm really interested in the kind of degrowth academics and degrowth scholars. And so I would encourage folks to, to read about degrowth because I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, interesting uh, work there. <clears throat> but one of my kind of favorite uh, or kind of to me, the most compelling frameworks around this work is uh, the framework that was established by an economist named Kate Rayworth um, that's called Donut Economics. Um, and maybe folks are familiar with this, but uh, the concept is that we need to essentially <laughs> keep ourselves in this donut, uh, so w which is, uh, you know, within pl our planetary boundaries, but also providing sort of the basic necessities for everybody to like live and flourish. Um, and so <clears throat> I think there's a really interesting opportunity to sort of see how a business, like sort of ask the questions or like, how, how can my business, you know, be both regenerative, uh, you know, so like keeping us within our planetary boundaries while also being distributive and thinking about like, you know, everybody having access to, uh, you know, education, health uh, and all like food, water, all, all these things that are absolutely essential to kind of living. And, and um, yeah, so I think that there's there's like a lot of opportunities to really uh, elevate that conversation. And I don't think that sort of the, the confrontation of growth needs to be antithetical to, uh, um, you know, business or, you know, uh, yeah, if that makes sense. Um, the last thing I'll, I think I'll mention is the, the I think there's like an amazing just to kind of like, you know, hammer down the point of like right now we, we the innovation that's happening around you know, climate related companies is like, is super important, right? Like in order, I mentioned the kind of list of solutions at the top and in order to kind of electrify the world, we need a bunch of companies to supply like energy efficient appliances and, uh, you know, uh, clean, uh, excuse me, um, uh, zero emission vehicles, electric vehicles, uh, high efficiency heat pumps. Um, and then like, you know, probably like the solutions around like, you know, like the Swedish company Oatly, like, you know, uh, like some plant-based alternatives for some things is probably good. Um, and so there's just like so many opportunities to kind of like solve, I think, a lot of these climate related issues through business and innovation. And that's another way while they're, while they're, when they're not necessarily like antithetical. Um, but um, I think it's super important that we 
kind of really focus on expanding the scope of what the company is for what what's it what's its purpose um uh and then yeah so that's kind of my thinking on that i think it's a it's a i obviously don't have all the answers it's a really huge question um and i think uh it's great that you brought it up and i think more and more people should should uh be, be thinking about this yeah thanks for for that reflection and and i i love the the message that uh you're mentioning that uh it's possible to change. Like it's not we we are like uh, not in a good situation. We know, but uh, the solutions are there, and and if uh, we want as individuals, as companies, we are able to uh, to to make this transition and to to produce this change. Um, as you mentioned at the beginning, like how as athletes we can push to to the companies ask the, the, those questions and uh, tell the companies we are working or what we are buying if they are doing these things to to be um, more more sustainable and to to implement these uh, these solutions and also as you mentioned with the activism to to really engage more so thanks uh, thanks for the conversation I really really enjoy it to, to talk about this this subject with you and um yeah i hope uh, we can catch up soon and uh, and go a bit more further on on this discussion it's been a pleasure yeah no thanks so much for having me yeah it's great great to chat with you uh look forward to more conversations and maybe when you come out to california we can do some uh, adventuring in the sierra nevada mountains <laughs> absolutely the be best ideas always happen i always say like best ideas <laughs> best innovations always happen when you are like climbing or running or doing activities there when you think okay i need to do that and, and that's going to work so yeah absolutely that's awesome yeah yeah i agree too yeah some some light bulb moments while like yeah on the the, the uh yeah like well while, while leading around or something in the like belay, that. you are thinking okay no i, I should yeah. write that but i don't want to to let the rope go from my from my friends <laughs> yeah. yeah oh no that, that happens to me for sure yeah. yeah that's good that's good it means that uh, the brain right. is working finding finding now new ideas oh yeah yeah running too especially yeah but i know it's the balance sometimes i think a lot and sometimes i like to do you know climbing or running just to kind of clear my mind from all this stuff uh that's another thing that's helpful because uh you can kind of find that flow state but um yeah well maybe we could do some brainstorming in the mountains sometime absolutely 